Psychologists uh, use a lot of devices to, um, to measure a person's character and uh, that person's ability. Uh, one of these is called the EQ test. And EQ stands for emotional quotient. Emotional quotient. EQ is a term that describes a person's ability to cope or to deal emotionally with various factors in one's life. Uh, work, for example, or relationships, or struggles, and so on and so forth. The idea is that our emotional makeup, in other words, how we react emotionally to all the different situations in life, determines how successful we will be. And scientists have found a way to measure and analyze this for different individuals, what their emotional quotient is like. Um, the point being made here is that our EQ is a more accurate guide in deciding our potential success in life than the traditional IQ. Now we're more familiar with the idea of the IQ, right? The intelligence quotient. Probably a lot of us took that test in school. Well, I believe that both of these measuring devices are, are good to measure our intellectual capacity and also to measure our emotional capacity, our ability to deal with different you know, with different situations. Some people have a wide variety of abilities to deal with all kinds of situations. Others have very few emotional tools to deal with different situations and so therefore they're less able to cope with change and so on and so forth. And so I think these measuring devices are good but they're incomplete in predicting potential success and of course potential happiness. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, Paul describes a more basic test to see if an individual will succeed. And it's called the LQ. So the, somebody was asking, well, what did you put up on the marquee there? You know, IQ, EQ, LQ, what does LQ stand for? And of course, uh, if you've been uh, listening to the songs that Bob you know, was leading tonight, they were all about love. And so LQ stands for the love quotient. And so let me read out of Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 and 14 and we'll make a couple of comments about that. Paul says, for you were called to freedom brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now Jesus had made this point in John's gospel when he said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus was making the point that it wasn't our IQ and it wasn't our EQ that determined our identity as His disciples. It was our LQ that served as a barometer for our Christian faith. People would know that we were disciples not by how smart we were, not by how psychologically balanced we were to deal with all kinds of situations, but rather the kind of love that we showed one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. He said that's the defining mark of the true disciple. You know, John, uh, often called the apostle of love because he wrote so extensively about its important in Christian living, explained why it was so important to work on our LQ as Christians. In the world, we might succeed if our intelligent quotient is very high, and we might adapt more easily and avoid failure if we're wired the right way emotionally. But the Bible argues that in order to live and succeed in the kingdom, not in the world, in the kingdom, to succeed in the church, to succeed in the spiritual world, you have to have a high LQ. Now, LQ and the height of our LQ, the ability that we have to love one another, proves certain things about us. 
A high IQ, for example, shows that you have a well-formed, well-informed, well-functioning mind. And a high EQ shows that you have a balanced character and an effective set of coping skills and you have good self-esteem. Well, in the same way, a high LQ also says several important things about you. For example, a high LQ tells a person that your faith is truly sincere. As I said before, Jesus claimed that the love of the brethren was a clear indicator that a person was a true disciple. He didn't say it was the only indicator, but that without the love of the brethren, it would be difficult to prove one's love for the Lord. After all, if you don't love and serve the people that Jesus died for, how can you claim to love the Lord and be His disciple? James says that faith without works is dead in James chapter 2 verse 17. To prove that point, James is saying that what Paul said in Galatians 5 verse 6 is that faith works through love. You know, we often explain that true faith is expressed in obedience and this is true because throughout the Bible we see this pattern over and over again, right? Faith is seen you know, becoming concrete through the obedience of the, of, the, of the believer. A person believes, and because he or she believes, they obey God. But this is not the only expression of faith. It is an expression of faith, but it isn't the only one. Faith also is expressed in love as well. A person believes, and because he believes, he loves the Lord. And that love is expressed in obedience. He loves those in need, and that love is expressed in service. He loves his enemy, and that love is expressed in forgiveness. You know, faith is an invisible thing. We can't see or touch the act of will that accepts as true what God says. That's what faith is. Faith is, I accept as true what God says. That's what faith is. But you don't see that. You don't see what's going on in the brain and the spirit as an individual accepts as true something that God says. Faith only becomes visible when it takes on a tangible form in love of some kind. This is how God revealed Himself. He, an invisible being, to physical man who is a visible being. He sent Jesus in human form to die for us, a very visible expression of His invisible self and a very, very visible expression of His great love for us. Our LQ is extremely important because it provides proof to God and proof to ourselves and proof to the world that our faith is genuine and alive and it's the type of faith that truly saves. Faith without love is dead and it cannot save. Faith expressed in love is alive and therefore powerful and uh, the power that it has is that it saves us from death. LQ also demonstrates the condition of our hearts. You know, just as IQ and EQ measure the condition of one's intelligence, measures the condition of one's emotions, LQ measures the condition of one's faith and the condition of one's heart. You know, that's, there's a relationship between how one loves and how one feels. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 to 21, John explains four reasons why a person who loves also feels good. And I want you to uh, turn over to 1 John chapter 4 and we'll read verse 16. Now remember the point that I'm making here. John explains four reasons why a person who loves God also feels good. First of all, he feels good because love draws us near to God. In verse 16 he says, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. 
You know, James says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. The surest way to draw near to God is to love the way He loves. Being near to God feels good. It produces joy, it produces peace, it produces confidence in the inner man. Remaining in this blessed state requires that we stay close to God and the only way to do that is to increase our love quotient. Yes, of course, know His word, obey His word, be with His people, uh, uh, offer worship, but if we want to stay close to God day in and day out, you know, throughout all the hours of our day, the way to do that is to increase our ability to love others. A high IQ also, uh, LQ rather, also removes fear. In verse 17, John continues to say, by this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. So what's John saying here? John says that for those who love, there is no fear of death. For those who love, there's no fear of condemnation or punishment. And why? Why is that? What's the connection there? Well, the connection is the following. Loving is a spiritual thing. It's acting out of one's spiritual nature. The more one loves, the more one is following the Spirit. The more one follows the Spirit, the more one is aware of and has confidence in the kingdom of God and His grace. Love opens one's eyes to see the spiritual world. It opens one's heart to the work of the Holy Spirit. It opens one's hope to the reality of heaven and the temporariness of this earth. You know, People who love do not have fear in their hearts because God has filled their hearts with His love. And people who are fearful and nervous, uh, you know, I tell them, don't buy a bigger dog. You're a fraidy cat type person? Don't, don't get yourself a bigger dog. Don't, don't, don't go buy more guns. That'll just play into your fear. If you want to get rid of the fear in your heart, start filling your heart with love. Love for the ones who are close to you. Love for the ones who are near to you. Love for your neighbor who's across the street. Love for your enemy. Love for the one who just gets on your nerves. <laughs> and maybe too, love for yourself. Start doing that, start doing those kinds of actions and you will dissipate the amount of fear that's in your heart and you will replace that fear with love. And how do you know that works? Because the Spirit tells us there's no fear where love is at. Where love is, where love is there is no fear. Number three, a high love quotient. Remember I said he said four things? A high love quotient also produces gratitude. Verse 19, he says, we love because He first loved us. We didn't begin with loving hearts. We begin with the usual LQ, which is love of family, love of friends, love of pleasure, perhaps love of country, love of high ideals, you know, all good things. But Jesus' love produces a new kind of love in us and that's the love of God. And this love of God produces the beautiful spiritual fruit of gratitude. Because He first loved us, we are filled with praise and thanksgiving, filled with the desire to do what is right, to do what is good in the name of Christ. A grateful heart is a contented heart. A contented heart is one that has stopped worrying and striving with the world around it. You know, sometimes the only thing that people have on their minds are what's, are what's wrong. What's wrong with me? 
What's wrong with you? What's wrong with the church? What's wrong with the elders? What's wrong with the government? What's wrong with my work? They just focus on what's wrong. And when you focus on just what's wrong, you deny yourself, even if you are a Christian, you deny yourself the opportunity to be content. Because always focusing on what's wrong simply empties you of whatever content you may have. But if you begin looking at things and begin to appreciate the things that are right, the things that are good, the things that you have, well then you are building within yourself this contentment that Paul talks about and this contentment that John talks about. It's such a sad thing to see Christians who have been faithful for 20 years or 30 years still not content in their hearts. And I've found by my experience, it's usually because they're focusing on all the wrong things that are around them, rather than focusing on the right things and the good things. That, that, you know, just because you're always looking for what's good, doesn't mean that you, you, know, you think everything is good. I mean, there are a lot of bad things. Are you kidding me? There's all kinds of bad things. The difference is, what is it that you choose to focus on? You know, Brother Harold's always saying, you know, he's, for as long as I've known him, he's always tried to get the entire congregation to have a reflexive answer. You know? So how are you all doing? You know? And he's waiting for the people to say, the Lord has really blessed me today. And that's, that's, that's a way to train us to look at the good things. I've heard people say, well, I, you know, there's so many bad things, I can't even begin to think of what's good. And I, and I asked them, are you able to blink? What do you mean, are you able to blink? Well, are you able to blink? Yeah, I said, well, you know, that's, that's a good thing, isn't it? Can you imagine if you weren't able to blink, if that little muscle didn't work? The kind of trouble you would have, your eyes would dry out, you'd have to do all kinds of things, you couldn't read, you know? That's a good thing, well, yeah, I guess. Can you swallow? What do you mean, can I swallow? Sure, I can swallow. Well, but can you swallow? Well, yeah. Have you ever met somebody who can't swallow? Who's had a stroke and has to learn all over again how to swallow? You ought to be thankful. Do you have 10 toes? Well, of course I got 10 toes. Well, could you imagine if you're missing three? Just pick any three. How about the fact that you have both of your thumbs? Would you like to be missing thumbs? I mean, I don't want to draw this example into ridiculousness, but you see what I'm saying? If you can't see the good, it's because you're not looking for it. It's because you want to see what's bad and you want to focus on what's bad. Well, there's plenty of bad out there, but you will never, ever have a content heart. You will never know the joy that comes from a grateful heart if you don't start focusing on what's good. Not only what's good out in the world, but what's good about you and what's good about you know, the other person and the, so on and so forth. And then of course, a high LQ guides my life. Verse 20, John says, we're back in 1 John 4, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So a high LQ guides my life. The condition of your heart will dictate what you say and what you do. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Matthew 12, verse 34. If my heart is filled with love, it is no effort, it is no work to love my brother and sister. It is simply an extension of my natural personality. My LQ is working for you. And loving others brings others love back to me in a blessed cycle of fellowship and blessing. People say, you know, what goes around comes around. 
Well, for people with a high LQ, what goes around is love and what comes back to them is love. People who don't feel good about themselves, people who seem to go from one conflict to another, they need to check their own personal love quotient before finding fault with their partners or their family or their surroundings. More love will usually heal and build one up and make life much more enjoyable, but it usually starts with me. It starts with me increasing my love quotient, not everybody loving me more. And as long as I've been in the church and as long as I've been, in a, uh, been a minister, that's one thing I heard all the time. People are saying disappointed, angry, upset, whatever, because in some way, shape, or form, they have not received the love that they think they deserve. And they don't, they don't get it. It's not the love you deserve, it's the love you give. I guarantee you, if you are focused on giving love, you will get love, you will get love back. So LQ determines the sincerity of my faith. It determines the condition of my heart. And it also determines God's attitude towards me. LQ not only determines what kind of faith I have and how I feel, it also determines how God feels about me as well. In Matthew 25, Jesus describes the scene at the end of the world where the great judgment will take place. And uh, He explains that the determining factor separating those who will spend eternity with Him in heaven and those who will be cast into hell will be the love quotient displayed by each while here on earth. If you read Matthew 25, you know, he, he doesn't say, well, you didn't know all the scriptures by heart. And I noticed that you know, on this particular doctrine, you, know, you didn't have exactly, you weren't spot on on this particular doctrine, so you go with the goats over here. That's not what he says. He says, did you feed the hungry? Love. Did you clothe the naked? Love. Did you visit the sick and the imprisoned? Love. Did you care for the orphans? Love. Did you care for the widows? Love. Are these not simply expressions of one's love in the name of Jesus? That's the question, he says. How was your love quotient? And yet God says that these acts will clearly divide those who had a high LQ from those who merely love themselves or those who love them back or love pleasure or distractions of this world. In the end, God will not measure how smart we were. He won't measure how well we were able to cope with the world. He will be looking for those who loved His Son Jesus Christ and they showed their love by serving others in His name. That's what He's looking for. That's what, that's what we're doing here, isn't it? Isn't that what Paul teaches us? That the goal of our instruction is what? Love from a pure heart? Imagine. He says to Timothy, the goal of our instruction, the, if, what you're shooting for in your teaching is that the brothers love each other. That's the goal of all instruction. That's what Marty is preaching about. That's what I'm preaching about. That's what we're, that's what we're shooting for. Whatever exercises we have, whatever opportunities we have to serve, it's always the same thing. If someone says we need a volunteer in the nursery, let, let's change that around. We need somebody who loves the children enough to go serve those children in the nursery. And if someone says, well, we need somebody to teach the high school class, what we're really saying is we need somebody who loves our young people enough to sacrifice themselves and go teach them. 
And if we need the bathrooms fixed or something like that, we're saying to somebody, look, we want you to love the congregation enough that you'll go in and fix the bathrooms so that they can be used properly. I mean, do I have to run through the entire flow chart? It's all about love. When the elders go and try to solve a dispute between two brothers or two sisters, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get them to a place where this brother and this sister or this sister and that sister will love each other again. That's what that's about. When the deacons organize a, a, a picnic or a, a Valentine's Day, what, what are they doing? They're trying to organize a situation where and sisters will come together and eat together and get to know each other. Why? So that they will love each other more. That's the whole point of this entire exercise. When we say, listen, we're going to try to invite people to come and hear Marty preach. He's going to have a series of lessons on the, the gospel, whatever. You know, what are we saying? We want you to love your neighbors enough and love your friends enough that you're going to expose them to the gospel of Christ. It's all about love. And I'm not talking about this wishy-washy, you know what I'm saying, movie Hollywood love. I'm talking about love that has a backbone. I'm talking about a love that's willing to give up some of self in order to do something for somebody else. You know, sometimes I wonder if I'm just too hard in preaching. When I first started to preach, 30% of my lessons were jokes. Anybody who remembers 1993, 92, when I first came here, there was always a lot of jokes, which is fine. But the older I get and the more I see people die, I realize this isn't a game. This is for real. You know, people try to make us think the Super Bowl, that's for real. No, that's a game. This is what's real right here. This is life and death right here. What we talk about is life and death. Eternal life, eternal death. If I preach too, too often in ways that demand that you devote yourselves more to God and the church, I worry that you may grow weary of hearing it, preferring perhaps happier themes, easier lessons. But then somebody dies, as I say, or someone is gravely ill and invariably the family's first concern is for the safety of that person's soul. All I can say to you is that the pleasure of sin is short-lived and the excitement of your toys and hobbies will lose their luster one day. But the knowledge of God and the presence of Christ and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, these things never grow old and they never disappoint. The only sure way to guarantee your salvation, the only sure way to have that eternal life is by believing and confessing Christ, by turning away from sin and your attachment to this world, and by being baptized for the remission of your sin, and to live a faithful, fruitful life, and here's the key for tonight, building your love quotient in Jesus' name. If you don't like the idea of love, if you oh, love, you know, if you don't like that, you're not going to like heaven. You're not going to enjoy heaven because that's all there is up there. There is no moaning and whining and there's none of that up there. It's about love. And so I say to you, maybe whether you like it or not, renounce the world. Give up the old man. Let God fill your heart with a full measure of His love in Christ. And maybe, and of course it's Sunday night, you know, I know who you are, but just in case, just, just in case, there's somebody out there who has not yet 
been immersed in the waters of baptism. And just in case there's somebody out there who has looked inside his or her heart and realizes there's not a lot of love there. And maybe that person, just maybe that person, needs to come forward and say, you know what? I need the church to pray for me that God find a way to fill my hard heart with His love so that I can begin loving other people the way I want to and the way God wants me to. Nevertheless, whatever you need, whatever ministry you need at this time, Bob's going to lead us in a song. Let's use that singing of that song to think over the things that I've said and if you need to come forward, we encourage you to do that now as we stand and as we sing.